Today, I'm much pleased to host a man loved by everybody, a treasure. This is how people point out at him. He is an Emirati Minister of State in the United Arab Emirates government. He has been active in UAE government service since 1968. He is an advisor at the UAE Presidential Court, born in Jerusalem and educated in Jerusalem and the United Kingdom. Before settling in Abu Dhabi, he began his career there as a journalist in 1967. He became director of information in the Abu Dhabi, then the UAE, Ministry of Information, editing its first official newspapers. He also worked as a broadcaster and program producer and helped in developing Abu Dhabi's broadcasting and media services. He is a director on a number of boards, including Abu Dhabi Center for Documentation and Research, the Paris Sorbonne University Abu Dhabi, the Emirates National School, the Permanent Higher Executive Committee of the Sheikh Zayed Book Award, and the Board of Trustees of the International Prize for Arabic Fiction. And the list is quite long. Zaki Musaibi, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ricardo. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you. First, the loss of Hatim Musaibi, your brother, who left us a week ago. Our common friend, Pur al Askari says, Hatim was often described as being larger than life, bon vivant, the fearless iconoclast, and the free thinker who loved life passionately. Your reactions? He was a great man, and therefore his loss was a great loss, not only for me, for his family, for his direct family, for his larger clan, but also for the wider community who knew him, worked with him, and loved him. It was sad for us to know that he has left us so soon. For me, he was always my younger brother. and I looked to him as a young person. And then to suddenly see that at the end of a long and accomplished career, uh, where he was beginning to prepare himself for a number of journeys and adventures, learning languages and traveling across the globe, he was taken away from us, but at the same time, I must say that he, had, he was a blessed person. We find solace in the fact that his life was filled with love, with joy, with laughter. We are, find solace in the fact that his company, Total, did an amazing uh, gest in taking his uh, body to be interred uh, in Jerusalem, uh, next to his parents and ancestors. And we find solace in the fact that he departed in peace. When the time came, he departed in peace and without pain and without suffering. One thing is sure that the Hatim Nusayba has impacted every single person he has encountered. He has so many friends and I have followed on Twitter and other platforms what people from all over the world wrote about him and said about him. May you perpetuate his loving memory. Well, both condolences and congratulations are in order, Your Excellency. The loss of a brother cannot but make us think about the importance of family. The Risaiba clan, the oldest Muslim dynasty in Jerusalem, has a long history and tight bonds with the Holy Land, Jerusalem. Since the days their first forefathers arrived into Jerusalem in the seventh century, Emirati today, how much of you remains Palestinian? The heart belongs to Jerusalem because Jerusalem belongs to the heart of every single individual on this planet. We are all tied, attached to Jerusalem as our spiritual anchor. But at the same time, the heart is fully Emirati because it was in the Emirates that I was able to find and fulfill my destiny, and particularly because I could do this marching uh, in the proximity of one of the greatest leaders uh, that humanity has ever uh, brought onto the world stage. The deal of the century made Palestinians and the Arab world lose the land. 
but not the history. The respect, but not the empathy. The battle, but not the dream. Did you feel concerned? Fully concerned, uh, and from the outset. Uh, in fact, one of my friends from Cambridge sent me a poem that I apparently had translated in 1968 for Unsil Hajj. And, and that was a poem about shame, about shame for what we have gone through in losing uh, our heritage. It was about shame in what, how the Arab world, where it has got to, where it has arrived uh, in dealing with not only now this issue, but with every issue that came our way. But at, and at the same time, I, was, I had the chance, the opportunity, the good fortune of continuing to be concerned with the cause of Palestine, with the cause of Jerusalem, with the injustice that had been meted out to, to the uh, people of Palestine, because Sheikh Zayed, the leader I worked with, was fully committed uh, and passionate about helping uh, the Palestinian people and about bringing justice, redressing the injustice that they have gone through. So I felt throughout my career, working with Sheikh Zayed, working with the UAE government, that everything is being done in a, in a very difficult situation to try and help uh, resolve, help bring to a conclusion, to a peaceful conclusion, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Arab, the Palestinian uh, issue to set up a state, independent state that all the world has agreed is a necessary step forward towards the security and stability of this region. We have not been able to achieve much, unfortunately, but at least uh, we were doing whatever we can in order to help in this cause. Recently, the UAE shared its first direct message on their position on the annexation plans of the West Bank to the state of Israel. As Palestinian born, how did that make you feel? And what do you see in the future for this situation? Let me start by saying that the situation looks bleak. Let us not kid ourselves. Uh, we are in a situation that is worsening every day. The UAE, as usual, tries everything it can to be positive, to be proactive, to try to help. And let us not forget, we need to help people in the end. We are not talking about an abstract uh, issue of occupying further land, of occupying water resources, uh, of bringing in immigrants to live in the place of the or, uh, in indigenous population. We are talking about the suffering that these people has to go through. I am, I am confident that the Emirates will continue these efforts, notwithstanding the fact that the outlook is very bleak. So since your childhood, you were fed and nurtured with those values and principles. How do you think your parents have shaped the man you are today? Your love for languages, your curiosity, your thirst for culture, for dialogue? Well, I was fortunate to have been born in Jerusalem, which is a city where the three faiths, if you like, intersect in order to create of one place, a city, an idea, a, 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 an encounter between religions, faiths, beliefs. And it was a beautiful and is a beautiful city. And so when I was young, I grew up amongst the mosques, the beautiful mosques, the churches, uh, the people who lived and worked in, the, in Jerusalem, a cosmopolitan society that was open and liberal. We had good education that was provided for us in our primary uh, schools. I had parents who were uh, very uh, pa passionate about teaching us the values in life. I remember that my father, as an example, always upheld the values of public service the fact that you do not come on this earth in order to look after your own personal interests, but you try to do what you can to serve and help your community. My mother, God bless her soul, was a deeply spiritual person, uh, a Sufi in her 
a religious, if you like, fashion, uh, but also a poet. And so she taught us the love of language and of poetry. Uh, I had friends. I was fortunate in having friends from different religions and different backgrounds who taught me how to live in respect of others and how to live in trying to understand one another. And then, of course, my father sent me early to England to continue my secondary education. I was very fortunate in having, again, uh, a top education that was provided to me in my secondary school, where I took my uh, exams before joining Cambridge, where I was able to continue developing the ideas, the curiosity, the values that were seeded in, in me when I was a little child in Jerusalem, walking the streets of Jerusalem and looking up to my father and mother as my ideal roles that I wanted to emulate and be respected by them for what I am aiming to do. Then came your turn to found your own family. What do you think is the role you've played in raising your daughters, Lana, who is currently a remarkable diplomat in New York City, and Yala, who is a director of Abu Dhabi Art. Both of them are watching us now. I personally do not know Anwar, but do you think that values and principles are transmitted from one generation to another, or for each era, the values differ and change? I tried to instill in my children uh, the same values and ideas that my parents instilled in me. Hard work and curiosity, respect for the other, and the, the desire, the passion to, to open up to others while preserving your own identity, your own heritage, and your own spiritual uh, roots, if you like. I try to teach them. I think the most important gift that any parent can give his children, the gift of reading. I really uh, started them very young. I used to take them back and forth, backward to school and forth uh, to school and tell them stories, but stories from Shakespeare, stories from the Greek gods, stories from Antar or Abla, from A Thousand Nights, so as to make them from the start uh, enthusiastic about going out and reaching out for those books. Uh, I also tried to instill in them the art of music uh, so that they could listen, also play, but also listen to music and understanding. And I remember our holidays, we spent a lot of time going through museums, looking at art, so that and I am proud to say all three of them came out with a huge sense of public service, the need to be useful to your community, the need to do things that are of value to others around you, the need to have empathy towards others, the need to be open to all beliefs and to all uh, other religions and, and value systems, the need to respect one another, and at the same time, to retain your soul and your identity. If I had succeeded in some or part uh, of this uh, if you, sister bringing them up, I am, would be very happy. Your Excellency, the encounter with His Highness Sheikh Zayed changed your life. Was it a twist of fate or a stroke of luck? I think it was both at the same time. You know, when I was in England and when I was in Cambridge, in fact, I had met Sheikh Zayed by chance because uh, he came in 1966, in the summer of 1966, and before he became ruler, to have dinner at the Jordanian embassy in London where my father was ambassador. And so I met him and met some of his companions. And that started my interest, if you like, in Abu Dhabi and its leader. And so I read books about him. Uh, and read about the country and read about the region. Now, at the same time, our family had some business interests in Abu Dhabi uh, from the 60s. Uh, and in fact, in 1964, I had come to Kuwait to stay with my sister during one of my school holidays. And she told me, why don't you go to a place called Abu Dhabi and look at around it? it uh, it's a new place that is being developed. We have a company camp, if you like, that you can stay in. 
So I went there and, uh, and Abu Dhabi that time, of course, was a fishing village by the sea, very small. But in 1967, when I came down from Cambridge, we had the Six Day War. And by that time, my parents had gone back to Jerusalem. Uh, the whole Middle East was in meltdown. And my father said, why don't you go back to, go to Abu Dhabi and try and work with the company uh, as a future career? Because there is nothing to be done in either coming back to Jerusalem or in the Middle East itself. So I came out in 1967 to work with the company and to make things short, it didn't appeal to my soul. So I started working as a, as a, a, a stringer, which is a, a, a moving, a roving correspondent who would get paid whenever he had an article published. Reuters, Financial Times, The Economist, BBC, Agence France Press. I became a kind of moving uh, press conference in the early days. And within three or four months, I really had met everybody, uh, decision makers in Abu Dhabi. It was still a small village. And in, within four months, I had met Sheikh Zayed, uh, God bless his soul, interviewed him for an English documentary, translated for him during that interview. And then that was an encounter with destiny, if you like. And from that day on, I worked with Sheikh Zayed and with the government of the UAE. You must have had uh, some great adventures with the founding father. Can you tell us one of these stories? He's an amazing person, not only as a leader with a vision, which he did have, but as a humane person, humble, and with empathy for everybody around him. You know, when I first started traveling with him, I will tell you two stories because I think they are significant. The first is we were in Spain walking around Alhambra and that was in 1969 and I was very young and enthusiastic and I wanted to push the tourists away from his path, you know, making way for the ruler. And, and actually he told me off and he said, we, we mustn't be any bother to those other tourists. We are all tourists here. Let us walk with them as we are with them. And that happened. And then in Spain also, the same incident, you know, we were watching the landing of the first man on the moon uh, in 1969. And all his companions were saying, but this is not true. You know, nobody can go through the seven heavens. This must be done in a, in a studio somewhere. And Sheikh Zayed told them, no, it can happen. This is the will of God. God created man and the universe, and man can do everything because it's in God's will. And they all said, you are right, al Umra. And that was the way that he led his people. He always brought them along with him, but by convincing them, convincing them of what, were, of what was right and what was not. Your Excellency, people have always looked to the UAE as a haven of peace, leisure, business, and love of life. For most of the past four decades, the UAE have maintained a low key role in the region. However, in recent years, its military has worked side by side with the US in the fight against Islamist extremism in Iraq and Syria. The UAE forces had a role in Afghanistan too as a member of the international coalition. It has been almost a decade where UAE is the new key role player in the Middle East. What is your say about this shift? Ricardo, it is always and will always remain a haven of peace and economic prosperity and leisure and well-being. It will continue to be a place that welcomes 200 different nationalities of different religions and belief sets and sects who can live and prosper and do well in the Emirates and who can help also their people from in the countries where they came from. But from the very outset, and let me also say this, from the very beginning, the UAE was always active to act not independently, but in consort with the allies and friends and the international communities in order to bring prosperity and peace not only within its own frontiers, but also around it. Sheikh Zayed always said that you cannot live as an island of prosperity and well-being if you're surrounded by 
uh, an ocean of conflicts and, and poverty and deprivation. And therefore, we must always play our part in helping others, in helping to bring stability and security to our region. And the UAE always played that part, even uh, in, during the, sad, the tragic war in Lebanon, the civil uh, war in Lebanon, when the UAE joined with the international United Nations forces in order to take away the mines that were left behind. It was always active in, in, in different ways. The UAE was never in its, on its, acted on its own. The UAE always believes that it should act with a consort of allies and friends who share our values and our beliefs. Now, today we live still in a very rough neighborhood. We live in the Middle East, a region that is riven by strife and conflict. We live in a region that is being uh, fed the poisonous ideology of uh, hatred and of uh, uh, extremism in your belief systems, in refusing the other, in uh, trying to annihilate the other. And therefore, we still believe that it is our duty, working with our friends and allies, whether international or regional, Arab or, or, or non-Arab, in order to bring this peace and stability to our region. And we, we believe it is our responsibility to work with our friends and allies in order to combat extremism. Because in the end, extremism brings nothing but destruction, not only to the countries where it has been spreading, but also to our own region and to the world. The UAE will turn 50 next year. What has been the biggest change or achievement you have witnessed? And what do you hope for the future? You know, Ricardo, I am always amazed by what is happening around me. I have been a witness, as you know, from the beginnings. So when I go back in my memory to the 60s and early 70s, when all my friends, the diplomats and the journalists who come, came through the region were telling me the Emirates will not survive the 70s. You know, there were too many threats to its stability and security. It does not have the infrastructure. It does not have the wherewithal to survive as a modern state. And Sheikh Zayed with his brother rulers worked together to create this state and this wonderful country where we live today. And you have seen it and you have come here and witnessed and experienced yourself the very special DNA that it has. So the first 40 years, I remember a time when we came here and there was no electricity and no water, no roads. You had to drive along sand dunes in order to go down from one emirate to, or to, to the other, or even within the city of Abu Dhabi. The last 40 years, I would say, have witnessed the establishment of cutting edge infrastructures that brought the UAE into the 20th century. And that has started with education, with health services, but also communications, and then creating this environment for business and, and, and being this open society that brings people from all over the world to participate in this progress. And then I believe the next 50 years, and this is a year where the UAE is preparing himself, in fact, to witness the next 50 years. The leadership of the UAE have put as an objective that in the next 50 years, the UAE by 2071 will have achieved the number one in a number of domains. Of course, this, the social services, education and health, technology. We are a country that is putting the foundations for renewable energy, for artificial intelligence, uh, to work our try and work adapting to what this world brings us in terms of challenges. So my answer to you, I believe my children, but even more so my grandchildren, will be able to see in the next 50 years the kind of miracles that I myself saw in the last 50. What has turned the UAE into an expat magnet over the past decades? Its environment of openness, its welcoming the others, it's the saying that Sheikh Zayed, I heard him say himself, that we must be 
open and kind to our own citizens, but we must also be more open and kind to the expatriate because an expatriate is a stranger who comes amongst you in a strange land. We need to look after him. How has culture played such an important role in the way Abu Dhabi decided to embark on this journey in terms of universities, museums? Because from the outset, uh, Sheikh Zayed has said, and the leadership today say, that our real resource is in our youth, in our own people. We need to bring to them the education and cultural flowering that is, that are needed, that is needed in order to make sure they are equipped to face the challenges of the 21st century. Culture is a central part of the UAE strategy for creating durable development, for opening bridges to the world, and for bringing peace, stability, and prosperity within our frontiers and in the region around us. Lisa Ayash asks you, do you think the economic growth of a newly developed states is built and dependent on the setbacks of regional war-torn countries? No, I believe that, in effect, Development depends on leadership, on governance. Uh, you can be in the most horrific of regional environments, and the UAE survived really the most horrific of regional conflicts you can imagine. And yet, because its governance, because its leadership was, were focused on the need to develop the country and bring prosperity to its people and help those around them, it was able to develop uh, in the way that it did. You need good governance, good leadership. This is the real key to bring a success, economic success to any country, whether new or old. Noor al Mu'ayimi would like to know if you had to change one thing when you were young, what would it have been? You know, I would not change a single day of experience that I had gone through because I believe that it was, they were blessed days that I had spent first when Sheikh Zayed was alive and today in being able to witness what is possible, what can be done in a country that is optimistic and open and liberal and allows others to come and create, to be a creative society. Your Excellency, the upcoming question of Mina al Arabi made me think of the fact that I have paid you visits a couple of times your houses in Al Ain and in Abu Dhabi. And we need to admit that once we step in, we feel we are in a museum or in a library. Books, all sorts of books and art pieces and art and paintings all over. Mina is asking you, you are known for your love of books. What three books would you say we should all read? That is a difficult question because uh, I keep changing my mind every time I read a great new book. But I can tell you what is worth reading. Uh, there are the last three books I have been reading because there I found them uh, an amazing discovery. Two, um, the three of them are interrelated. Two of them are about the Palestinian artist Kemal Bullata, who sadly left us, departed from this life last year. One is about his work. And the second is the collection of his writings. And they are worth reading because they bring new, if you like, insights into the development of uh, art in the Arab world, the modern uh, art in the Arab world, and insights into his own uh, experience uh, with art and with abstract art and with, uh, the, with calligraphy. And the third book, which came out recently, is the book that uh, has, writes about the exhibition that took place in the Gray Gallery in New York or the collection, the Barjil collection, my friend, my dear friend, uh, Sheikh Sultan bin Saud al-Qasimi. And it's about the abstract in modern art, Arab art. And it talks about the development of this abstract art. So if you ask me now this week, what are the three books I would really encourage people to read? I would say these three books. Ask me next week, it may be something else again. So next time I see you, definitely, I'm going to ask you the same question, and I'm going to see what you suggest. And I'll take this suggestion into consideration, and I'll buy the books accordingly. 
Well, I've got two questions in a row from Fiona Jagosi. I believe they are interrelated. How can life be improved for the indentured laborers of the UAE? And in terms of fraud building and so forth, who provided the core of labor for this? I will once again come back to say that the UAE, of course, depends uh, and has depended uh, throughout the uh, decades of development on the major contribution uh, brought by Indian, Pakistani, uh, Southeast Asian uh, labor who came here, worked here, uh, and uh, spent their lives here uh, building our cities and our develop different urban centers. But at the same time, I can assure her that the government has always had the interests of these people at heart. I know there were a number of reports that were published uh, from now, from time to again. We listen, we hear about them, about the mistreatment of labor in the Gulf countries, about the kafala system, uh, about the rights of labor, about the, the payment of their salaries. And I know that the UAE government is doing everything it can in order to bring legislation that will provide help uh, to this labor and to ensure that they are paid their salaries uh, through the banks now rather than to be paid in cash. Undoubtedly, from time to time, there will be issues and there will be problems. But I know personally, from the time from Sheikh Zayed, as I said, when he used to go to the MENA, the, the harbor in Abu Dhabi, where some Iranian merchants used to come across the Gulf bringing trick trucks with them, things to sell. And he would buy everything they had because he told us, you know, these merchants came here uh, trying to sell so that they take food back to their families, we need to help them. So the empathy, the feeling, you know, the, 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 the trying to help is there. If there are failures, the government tries its best always to rectify any failure that there may exist in the system. Bob Debas asks you, we know that the UAE is a peacemaker in the region, and many in the Arab world feel that Qatar-Saudi issue, as well as Yemen-Saudi, should be worked on. What is the UAE doing to bring in peace to both of those crises? You know, the UAE is a firm believer uh, in the need to work for peace, to resolve all issues by diplomatic channels, to try to resolve all conflicts in peaceful way. And uh, we always work in consort with our allies and friends uh, to bring this about. Now, only recently, I think it was yesterday, the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Anwar Gergash, said that one of the real uh, important, if you like, preconditions or necessary steps that need to be taken in this region is really de-escalation post-COVID because we are facing a lot of issues with COVID. We will come to the end perhaps of this pandemic, the first, in at least the first stage of it. We really need to work at de-escalation, but de-escalation in the region, which is necessary because all countries can only prosper when there is peace and stability. That can only come when there is a will on all sides to do this. He also added that for the time being, it seems to be a difficult outlook, but nevertheless, our hope has always been, and we will continue to work with our allies and friends in order to de-escalate situations whenever we can and bring prosperity and peace to people. Because in the end, as I said, whether it is in the Yemen, whether it is in Libya, whether it is uh, in this region, we need peace and we need to bring prosperity and particularly post-COVID, when there is going to be an economic uh, issue that faces all countries of the region, we need to focus on working together, collaborating together to help our peoples lead a better life. What is the best piece of wisdom learned from Sheikh Zayed? Be humble. Do not be proud of who you are but be proud of what you do in serving others. Your role in cultural diplomacy and how do you deal with culture during these days? 
cultural diplomacy is, uh, is one, uh, as you know, an aspect of foreign policy that has been in use for thousands of years. So we are not bringing something new to the table, although the, uh, the terminology itself of cultural diplomacy has been developed recently. Uh, and Sheikh Zayed was our first cultural diplomat in 1969, before we had an infrastructure in Al Ain. He asked us to build a museum, an archaeological museum that talks about the culture uh, of this region 5,000 and 4,000 years ago, when there was commerce between this area, the communities who lived here, and the Indus Valley and Mesopotamia. So culture is in our DNA, and our culture, the culture of the UAE, is a culture of openness, uh, seafaring. It's a mixture of a seafaring tradition with also the, the, the desert traditions of generosity and honor and help to your neighbor and to strangers and to the guest who comes uh, to your uh, abode. So cultural, our, what I am doing is, is simple, is I am trying to use the cultural assets that we have in plenty uh, in the UAE, both public and private, uh, the cultural stakeholders who have very, been very active in whatever they carry out, and then act as a transmitter, uh, a facilitator with our embassies and missions abroad, because this is a message we need to take uh, abroad through our embassies to tell the world who we are and to tell the world the message about what we stand for. This is what I try in a small way to help, but it is something that is uh, central to the UAE government's policy. I mean, we have a Ministry of Culture that is very active in promoting the arts and culture. We have departments of culture in every Emirates. We have a Binali in Sharjah, an art foundation, private foundation. I'm happy to say that the UAE is really uh, brimming with cultural activity that is important we need to take this to the, uh, to the rest of the world. Will the coronavirus impact the way governments allocate budgets and will culture be the first victim of such changes as most fear and speculate? Uh, undoubtedly, there will be an impact. I mean, there is an economic impact. Uh, and as a result, governments are cutting down budgets, not only in culture, but across the board. But my sincere hope is that culture will be, in fact, supported and subsidized because exactly this kind of pandemic, this kind of challenge that we are facing requires culture in order to bring us through the tunnel, through this dark tunnel that we are moving in and to see light at the end of this tunnel. Because in the end, we need to bring empathy, openness, creativity, and in the long term, this is also economically rentable. It is something that is viable, economically viable. It has been shown over and over and over. The more you invest in cultural development, the more you serve your economy. So I sincerely hope that governments look seriously at uh, the cultural sectors in their, uh, in, the, in their countries and try and subsidize and help rather than cut uh, the help that they give to them. UAE 2030 vision to moving to a knowledge-based economy will mean harvesting tax savings of local youth and absorbing them into the private sector, especially young women. How can we make STEM and arts more attractive to the younger generation in UAE and GCC area? We are very serious about STEM and about the education that it brings to our schools. We have introduced them into our schools. We believe that this is central for the future. We are investing heavily in artificial intelligence, but I still believe strongly that the liberal uh, education, a liberal education is equally important. We must not let one take precedence over the other. We must keep both of them together. How do you find the future of women leadership in the UAE? We are a, a country in which women now are in leading positions, and we are proud of the fact uh, we have more than nine ministers, half of our National Assembly. Uh, we have women pilot fighters, fighting fighter pilots. Uh, we have, this is the, the road forward. As uh, Thomas Friedman was saying on a webinar yesterday, you need to have 
gender plurality uh, in order and other post preconditions in order to have progress in any society. We are proud of what we have been able to achieve. And I must say here that Sheikh Fatma bin Timbarak, you know, we have to be grateful to the great efforts she put into making sure that the Emirati woman is well educated, well trained, well equipped steeped in her heritage and tradition, but also open to the world. The UAE will launch a historic mission to Mars. How does it make you feel to see this small country reach for the stars? What an amazing, amazing experience to go through. Now let me go back then to the first anecdote I brought you. You know this, one of the men sitting with Sheikh Zayed in Spain, to tell him yeah. that nobody can go through the seven heavens, was one of the chiefs of the tribe of the Man Manasir. And it is, it, is, it is, I think, indicative of what is happening in the Emirates, that our face spaceman who went to the space station was a grandson of that Mansuri. So the grandfather didn't believe that it was possible through, to go through the heaven. A grandson has been to space. This shows you where this country is going, where we can all go if we focus, on investing in our youth, in our children, uh, and to bring uh, science and education and culture into their homes. Fiona Jagose asks you, I noted that many youth in the UAE have very few responsibilities, such as cleaning up after themselves, preparing a meal, maybe even taking on a part-time job, and so on. While this might be fun and feel they were missing out on a thorough social education, do you think the youth should be encouraged to do some work within their lives so as to foster a deeper understanding and compassion? Absolutely. I believe that's very important. I never forget one diplomat, a European diplomat who had five children. He was a Catholic uh, diplomat from a friendly country. When his children grew up to a certain age, he told me, Zaki, I'm going to take them away from here because I don't want them to get used to the fact that if they want to have lunch, there will be some a maid in the house to help them eat that lunch. So yes, I believe, again, the responsibility of parents to make sure that their children grow up with the right ideals and values and traditions. Your Excellency Zaki Musaibi, thank you so much for this enriching talk we had together. Like I've said and mentioned at the beginning, everybody loves you. You are an added value to each talk show and to each interview. I wanted to conclude my own way However, I have received a small note, a very touching one, I'd like to share with you and with the audience. This note comes from a cousin of yours. He says, dearest cousin Zaki, you mentioned educating our children, but you are also a prime example of lifelong learning. Literature and art are a life endeavor, perhaps, our society can promote education of the old as well as the young. Hugs and kisses, Bashar Nusaybe. Education is for life. I will give you the floor to end up and conclude your own way. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you for everything that you do. You have been a major player in this region to bring understanding uh, between uh, people's cultures, uh, you have been a great cultural icon, uh, and I know that uh, your life has been full of uh, experiences that made you who you are. I hope that others will learn from your example. I am encouraged by what you are doing in spite of COVID, using this digital new technology in order to continue your mission. I wish you in it every success. And I wish all those who joined us today as every success. I thank them. I hope that they have stayed out the COVID uh, shutdown, lockdown, and I wish for them happier days ahead. Once again, I'm much grateful. Allow me to thank my team and the national team for putting all their heart and efforts to make this show a success. Do not chat every two weeks. See you then. Bye-bye.